I'm not doing anything bad. So I don't really think there's anything wrong with what I'm doing. I'm just fornicating. I'm not, I don't even curse. I don't even drink. All I'm doing is just, you know, laying it down, breaking it down with my man and that's it. But it's still wrong. It's still wrong. Hello, angels. Happy Wednesday. How is everyone feeling? So in today, we're going to jump right into it. We are going to be continuing the discussion of studying the book of James chapter by chapter to gain wisdom and insight on what a Christian is straight from the Bible. So the reason I feel like this is so important to talk about is because I know that there have been a lot of people that may have grown up Christian or, you know, maybe they've turned away because they felt that the people that they may have looked up to didn't necessarily exemplify what they were being told or basically they weren't practicing what they were preaching. Or maybe you're just curious about Christianity, or maybe you're simply a babe in Christ. Regardless, I am very happy that you were here. Thank you so much. Let's jump right in. So last week I spoke about chapters one through three, right? And today we're going to unpack the last two chapters of James. Now, as we know, James was Jesus's half-brother, and the book of James has actually more similarities to the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus had given in the book of Matthew um, in the New Testament. So James relied heavily on Jesus's teaching. So now moving forward, James 4 verses 1 through 3 talks about quarrels and fights among believers. They're harmful. And James is explaining that these conflict result from evil desires battling within us. Okay. We want more possessions. We want more money. We want higher status. We want more recognition. And when we don't get what we want, sometimes we conspire to have it. This shows why coveting is forbidden in the Ten Commandments, okay? And it can lead people to kill in pursuit of their desires or in frustration over unfulfilled ones. While coveting can lead to murder, the killing James is referring to can also manifest as bitter hatred and backbiting. Instead of aggressively pursuing what we want, we should submit ourselves to God, asking him to help us get rid of our selfish desires and trust him what we really need. Because at the end of the day, it really is true. The deeper you get into your word, I think I started to read the book of, I really hope I'm getting this correct because I don't think it's Ephesians. The book of Ecclesiastes talks about how really there's no other meaning to life other than worshiping God. Because I don't remember who the main character was in there, but he was basically saying that nothing. he's had all these things in life, all this possession, all this status, all these different things, and nothing meant anything to him other than he realized only his relationship with God is what matters most. And I know that it's so much easier said than done, but this is something that we have to do because it is in the Bible. So this is something to consider that we have to be very careful of wanting, wanting, wanting all these different things and getting so desperate where we're idolizing it. And so as a result, we are going to conspire to get certain things that goes against what the Bible wants for us or says for us in verses four to six, right? It talks about what can help us combat our selfish tendencies, learning humility, okay? Also pride, it makes us self-centered and leads us to conclude that we deserve all that we see, touch, or imagine. It creates greedy appetites for far more than we need. We can be released from our self-centered desires by humbling ourselves before God, realizing that all we really need is his approval. God not only gives us good gifts, but he gives us good desires. When the Holy Spirit fills us up, we see the world's seductive attractions for what they are, cheap substitutes for what God has to offer. It is exactly that. They are cheap substitutes for what God has to offer. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changing. There's a, there's really a fundamental piece that you really begin to have when you really start to dig deeper into God's word. it, it can be better experienced rather than explained. Because I remember even with New Age, it felt like this just perpetual state of like, they're kind of being an answer for everything and kind of like being okay with like suffering because that just was like, 
every retrograde, you're going to experience this emotion and and every like, you know, oh, because the moon is in this sign or whatever. And to be clear, when it comes to astrology, because I definitely want to do a separate separate episode on that, it is you basically coming into agreement with those demonic signs and coming into agreement with those things over your life. Okay. So it that's also uh divination. Anyways, and so in verses seven through ten, okay, how can we draw closer to God? So James gives us five ways, right? Humble yourselves before God, yield to his authority and will and commit your life to him and his control and be willing to follow him. Resist the devil. Don't allow Satan to entice you and tempt you. Wash your hands and purify your hearts, okay, to lead a pure life. Be cleansed from sin, replacing the desire to sin with the desire to experience God's purity. Let there be tears for what you have done. Do not be afraid to express deep, heartfelt sorrow for what you have done. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Also, recognize that your worth comes from God alone. To be humble involves leaning on his power and guidance and not going your own independent way. And that is the deception of what the enemy wants us to do. I did this. I'm self-made. And my dad said in service today, don't be self-made, be God-made. Everything is about me, 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 me. That is what the enemy wants us to do, because if you even think about what satanic worship is, it is the worshiping, worshiping, the act of worshiping oneself. That's what satanic worship actually is. What do I want to do? I have these desires. I should be able to do it. I Whatever. There is no right and wrong. I, If I want something, I desire something. And that's the thing that the enemy also does to deceive us is he convinces us somehow with perverting the truth and literally trying to convince us that, oh, as long as I'm not like a bad person, like I and I'm not like stealing and killing and doing all these different things, then like I don't think I can be demonically oppressed or demonically influenced because I'm not doing anything bad. So. I don't really think there's anything wrong with what I'm doing. I'm just fornicating. I'm not, I don't even curse. I don't even drink. All I'm doing is just, you know, laying it down, breaking it down with my man and that's it. But it's still wrong. It's still wrong. You, th that is against the Bible. If it's against the Bible, it is wrong. Because why? The Bible is truth. I digress. To humble yourself, like I said, involves leaning on his power and guidance and not going your own independent way. Now, although we do not deserve God's favor, because we don't, he wants to lift us up and give us worth and dignity despite our human shortcomings, okay? Um, again, I'm reading this. I'm just skimming through this on this second part. Um, I went more in depth with everything in the first part, but I really encourage you guys to get this Bible. Um, it's pretty thick when you get it. It's the Life Application Bible um, by Tyndale. This is also in my Amazon storefront. Or you can get the app, which I discovered on my own. I was just curious if they had a Bible app and you can purchase this for $19.99 on in the app store and have it on your iPad and read through the commentary of these things, um, especially because now I am also trying to train myself to only read out of the King James instead of reading the scripture directly from there. Like I kind of do King James first so I can receive deeper revelation on things and study that way and then also have commentary. Anyways. And in verses uh, 11 through 12, it is basically warning us as believers against judging others and obeying God's law of love. Now, this is a hard one. OK, can we just be real and can we be honest? Like, I actually do want to read this one. Do not speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law and not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Jesus summarized this law as loving God and your neighbor. And Paul said that love demonstrated 
toward a neighbor would fully satisfy God's law. Now, when we fail to love others instead of constantly judging them, we are actually breaking God's law. We have to examine ourselves. We have to examine our attitudes and our actions towards others. Do you build people up? Or do you tear them down? Remember God's law of love and say something positive or encouraging instead. Even if you have to speak a difficult truth, you can do so in a constructive, respectful manner. Saying something beneficial to others will cure you of finding fault and increase your ability to obey God's law of love. I know that this is so much easier said than done because some people may very much be wrong and it's it feels almost opposite, right? Like when you think of the worldly perspective, it feels like why on earth would I ever be nice to someone that is that is not nice to me? Why would I be kind to somebody that is not kind to me? Why would I like, no, when we grew up with the saying, treat people like you want to be treated, you know what I mean? And so it's like, or, or treat people how they treat you. You know what I mean? Like, that's what we kind of were raised to, to really, uh, in society, we're, we're raised on that, on that system of thinking. But in the Bible, it's saying like, you should love everyone and not really judge them. And the thing is, again, like I really do believe God tells us not to judge, but he does teach us how to judge. So there are certain things like I know people may say things like, oh, well, then how come you say like, first of all, I I'm not saying I'm getting this out of the words. So I want to be clear. I'm always trying to gain biblical insight, provide biblical insight. So it's not, well, you said, no, it's what God said. Right. So. For me, when I think about people having questions like, oh, well, how can you say not to judge people, but you're saying to not hang out with people, whatever, it's because in the Bible, right, we're not judging them. We're not trying to condemn anyone. That is not, that's what the devil does. The devil condemns, God convicts. So if you were hanging out with people that are not conducive to your walk, you're not judging them by not hanging out with them. You're just separating yourself because what do you guys really have in common? There's a difference. You're not even thinking about those people that you're not hanging out with. You're not like, huh, I don't hang out with them because like you, you don't really have that attitude. It's more of, hey, like love you in the Lord, do your thing like somewhere else, just not around me because we're not going to be friends. And these are the things that you're doing. It's because of what I stand on. My faith is what I stand on. God's word is what I stand on. And there will be times, I want to be clear, where you standing on what God's word says is going to come across as, you know, to some people like you are judging them. And if that is the case, then so be it. Then I guess you're judging. It is what it is. Next in verses 13 to 17, it's providing us about a warning of self-confidence, okay? So it is really good to have goals, right, in life, but goals can disappoint us if we leave God out of it. Why make plans as though God does not exist when he holds the future in his hands, okay? Seizing opportunities or being assertive without considering what God wants will lead us to frustration because you know you ever experience a time where it's just like everything's going right and then it just doesn't for no reason and all of a sudden you find yourself just like out of alignment and you thought that everything was going well but I guess not a lot of the times I believe that this happens and we run into this wall when we are not consulting with God when we leave God out of our plans so good planning starts by asking these questions you know what what I like to be doing next year, tomorrow. How will I react if God steps in and rearranges my plans? If you truly believe with conviction that God only wants the best for us, he only wants good things for us, and you rehearse that, okay? You will really start to realize that everything that disguises itself, even as a missed opportunity or whatever, is just redirection, it is just God's way of saying, not this, I have something better. No, but seriously. So when we're leaving God out of our plans, I believe that God also puts us in positions to, to realize that he is God above all, that he is sovereign and that we have to rely on him. We have to depend on him because every good and perfect thing comes from him. We should plan ahead, but we should hold on to our plans loosely because if we put God's desires in the center of our planning, he's not gonna disappoint us, okay? I really encourage you guys, by the way, to read in depth 
to these verses um, because unfortunately the reality is I really don't have much time for today's podcast. And that's why I can't read it verse by verse, which I really would like, which I did in part one. Um, I'm just mainly reading the commentary uh, because it is so good. Like James, it, the book of James is such a, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. Next we are on to James five, which is the last chapter. It's basically a warning to the ungodly rich. Okay. I want you all to pay attention to the commentary because I want you to understand the text of the scripture because it may be a little confusing. So just to give brief context, overall in verses one through 12, the themes are about being humble and patient and enduring. And James had emphasized the need for complete dependence on God. And he basically is now rebuking you know, those who lived independently from God, which a lot of the times tended to be, especially back in those days, a lot of the rich people. And the reason being is because at times when everything is going super well for us, we tend to forget God, the one who blessed us. So let's break this down. James in James five, verse one through six, right? James proclaims the worthlessness of riches, not the worthlessness of the rich. Today's money will be worthless when Christ returns. So we should spend our time accumulating the kind of treasures that will be worthwhile in the eternal kingdom, which is your ministry. We all have ministry on our lives, okay? It's not always gonna look like having a platform. It's not always gonna look like being a pastor, an apostle, a bishop, uh, um, uh, an evangelist or whatever. It could be something else. Your ministry could be children's ministry. Your ministry could be in sports, like you ministering to people in that field. Like there are so many different ministries that each of us can have. This is why our kingdom work, what we are doing on this earth is so important because money is not the problem. Christian leaders, they do need money. This is the part no one likes to talk about to help them spread the good news. Churches need money to do their work effectively. Huh, well, I don't understand why churches ask for money, all these different things. Oh, well, when you walk into a building, you walked into a church probably because you thought it was nice looking on the outside. That costed money to build that building. When you walked inside of the facility on a a 95 degree day and you don't need to use a church fan to fan yourself because you're not sweating, that air conditioning to air condition the place also costs money to run effectively and efficiently. Oh, and then you need to get up because of all the bottles of water that you're drinking and you need to go use the bathroom. Well, that bathroom being built also does cost money as well. So I feel like a lot of the times people don't consider these things as it pertains to church expenses. I digress. It's the love of money that leads to sin, right? And causes people to oppress others in order to get more. This is a warning to all Christians who were attempted to adopt worldly standards rather than God's standards, as well as an encouragement to all those who are oppressed by the rich, okay? Now, in verses seven through 12, it discusses patience and endurance, all right? And it says, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for valuable harp." harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. I love that. Um, Even in verse nine, where it says, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged for look, the judge is standing at the door. Now I want to say like, again, it's the trying of, you know, your patience, your faith that worketh patience. Okay. Patience produces endurance. So With that being said, he's saying he wants us to be patient, okay? That the that he is coming, he is near, okay? That to, for us to be patient as we are waiting for the Lord's return, all right? No matter how eager you are for that opportunity, for that relationship, whatever the case, be patient. It even says in the Bible for a lot of people that are idolizing, you know, relationships, marriage, what have you, it says, do not awaken love before it's time. Mm, that's a word for someone. And so, you know, it seems like I'm going a little bit backwards here. Well, in verses seven through eight, it says a farmer does not give up his crops, right? When it comes to harvesting immediately, he keeps on working 
even when the crop cannot be seen at all. This means faith without works is dead. You have to have the fir- the faith and you also have to put work toward that. Even so, Christians must work hard and exercise patience and endurance even when the harvest seems far away. God, I cannot see it, but I believe anyway. That's faith, right? It's the substance of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for. So if you think about that, even when you don't see it, you have to believe and you have to trust it, okay? That is faith. God rewards us for having faith in him and following his word. That's what it looks like to also be a believer and to be a Christian, Okay. And it's important for us to not be grumbling against one another. Okay. You're going to experience, I'm reading this from Enduring Word, times of hardship can cause us to be less loving than our Christian brothers and sisters. James reminds us that we cannot become grumblers and complainers in our hardship, lest we be condemned even in our hardship. What happened to the people of Israel? They were in bondage for how many years? Pretty almost 400 years, okay? They were in bondage. And even when they came close to the promised land, they came close, they missed their blessing because they kept on complaining. It says in the Bible, enter into his gates with praise and thanksgiving. This is how you really begin to access God as well, is you enter into his 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 gates with praise and thanksgiving, not griping and complaining. There's a difference between God, I need you to rescue me in this moment. God, I feel like you're not near whatever. Then, oh, I feel like when we are complaining about things all day long, we are we have a victim mindset. How can we have a victim mindset when we have the victor, Jesus, on our side, when we have the advocate, the Holy Spirit to accompany us, to be our comforter. You won't know this, one, if you don't know it, two, you won't feel it if you do not implement it. You can't, you have to implement the knowledge. Now, when it says, behold, the judge is standing at the door, Jesus comes as a judge, okay? Not only to judge the world, but also to assess the faithfulness of Christians. In light of this, we cannot allow hardship to make us unloving towards each other because God at the end of the day was very compassionate, very merciful to to even Job. Okay, because think about it in the whole process, it says that God used Satan himself at the end of it all. God had accomplished something wonderful to make Job better and more blessed than any man ever. Remember that as good as Job was in the beginning of the book, he was a better man at the end of it. He was better in character, humbler and more blessed than than before. In verse verse 12, it says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with or with any other oath. OK, that's basically what it's saying. And James, again, was teaching. He was echoing the teachings of Jesus Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, where, you know, people need to swear to make oaths, you know, beyond a simple yes or no. It betrays the weakness um, of one's word. It demonstrates that there's not enough weight in one's own character to confirm their words. And think about how normalized this has been in society. Like, oh, Pinky Pomus, I swear, right? You're not supposed to swear. And that's what that scripture is about. Lest you fall into judgment. So this lack of character, right, will be exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. This should actually motivate all of us to prepare for that judgment by speaking with integrity. So yes, the words that you say matter, especially as an unbeliever, the words that you say have weight. What is the spiritual value in the things that you are saying, the things that you are speaking, okay? Verses 13 through 18 highlights the power of prayer. I love that. Verses 15, we should pray for others in faith, expecting that God will heal them and then leave the matter in God's hands. Verse 16, We should confess our trespasses to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. Now, this does not mean go around telling everybody your business, but James is reminding us that a mutual confession and prayer brings healing both physically and spiritually. Confession 
can free us from the heavy burdens physically and spiritually of unresolved sin and removes hindrances to the work of the Holy Spirit. There's so much power in repentance and confession. I'm telling you, asking God for his forgiveness for things really cleanses and purifies you. If you don't have someone to talk to, then confess it to God. Repent to God, confess it to God. But either way, both are absolutely necessary in our walk as Christians. Yeah. So when it comes to confessing to one another, if you happen to be fortunate enough to have a friend, confession to another in the body of Christ is great. It's it's kind of essential, right? Because sin will demand us to keep it to ourselves, isolate it from other people. And confession breaks the power of sin. It breaks the power of secret sin. Yet confession needs to not be made to maybe, you know, necessarily a priest. Like, you know how in Catholicism, I believe you go into the box and you say, you speak to the priest or whatever. But even if we confess to one another, that's also appropriate. Confession is good, but it must be made with discretion. You need to have discernment about who you're going to tell what. You know what I mean? An unwise confession of sin can actually cause more sin because sometimes you can tell someone something depending on what you're discerning and it can lead them in a certain direction. Okay. Or maybe what that person says in response is like, girl, so what? Do your own thing. And they can ill advise you and that can cause you to sin more. But by all means, avoid phony confession. Okay, not having true conviction, because if it isn't deeply felt, then it's just no good. And a lot of the times, most of our prayer, it says is not effective because it's not fervent. Fervent means passionate. It is offered with a lukewarm sort of attitude, right? Effective prayer must be fervent as believers, not because we are trying to emotionally persuade God, but because we We must gain God's heart by being fervent of the things that he is fervent for. Verse 17, it says, it talks about the fact that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Okay, Elijah was a model of an earnest prayer that was answered by God. So his effectiveness in prayer extended even to the weather. And this just shows Elijah's heart was so in tune with God because he prayed for the rain to stop and start only because he sensed it was in the heart of God in his dealings with Israel. So when we are praying fervently, we're praying earnestly, right? To pray by definition is to make sure that we are praying earnestly with sincere and intense conviction. Lastly, in verses 5, 9, 19 through 20, restoring wandering believers. Mm. This is this. I love this book. I I really do. The last verse is really significant because it speaks to believers who have backslid, fallen into sin. They're no longer living a consistent. They're no longer living a life with consistent Christian beliefs. This is very serious and this requires repentance. Okay, so verses 19 to 20 It says, my brothers and sisters, if someone is among you and wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. So James is urging us as Christians to help those that have wandered away from the faith by praying. So we must pray for these people, right? And I'm just gonna read the commentary last. So this passage refers to a believer who has fallen into sin, no longer you know, living with the Christian values and beliefs. And many discussions have occurred over whether people can lose their salvation. But all interpreters agree that those who fall away from their faith are in serious trouble and need to repent. So James urges Christians to help those that have wandered from the faith and returned to God by taking initiative and praying for those people, acting in love where we can meet them where they are and bring them back to God for his forgiveness. And the book of James emphasizes faith in action. Godly living is the evidence and the result of faith. Believers must serve with compassion, speak lovingly, truthfully, live in obedience to God's commandments and love one another. The church ought to be an example of heaven on earth, drawing people to Christ through love, for God, for each other. If we truly believe in God's word, we will live it day by day. God's word does not merely give us something to read or think about, but something to do. Belief, faith, and trust must have hands and feet, our hands and feet. We have to get to work. That's what it's about. So 
That wraps up the part two of what it means to be a Christian. Again, I am out of time, but I strongly encourage you guys to go and read chapters four and also chapter five. I really love uh, reading it out of the Life Application Bible. It is in the New Living Translation, but reading those last two chapters will really, really help you and encourage you. And I will also list, please remind me if you are listening to this and go comment on my channel to remind me to leave the resources for how I get where I get my commentary from um, and et cetera, et cetera. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. With that being said, do not forget that I love you and God loves you. And I'll speak to you beautiful angels in my next episode. Mwah.